Well, good morning and welcome to Northeast Online. My name is Micah and I am so excited to be joining with you guys today again online as we finish our current series, We Love 40509. And actually, Philip gave a great word last week talking about like, not just who is your neighbor, but will you be a neighbor to those around you? And Pastor Monty is going to finish up the series today talking more about how we do that. What does that look like as we continue to love those around us in our community, especially in the world such as today? And you're joining with us today. We're so excited to have you. Will you just leave your name and like where you're tuning in from in the comment section below? We have people tuning in from all across the country, and it's always so encouraging and exciting to know that we're joining together in this one place as the church. And we're going to worship together today uh, through singing, through prayer, through this time of communion, through a message, through scripture. And then we always close with this time of generous giving uh, as we worship through that at the close of the service. But really, we're just so excited that you're here today. We're so excited to, to learn together, to grow together, and to be challenged together here today. Well, why don't you go ahead, grab your coffee, um, grab something to take some notes with, turn the volume up, and let's worship together.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no
Luke chapter 22, verse 19 says this, And he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them, his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So church, every week we set aside this intentional time to join together and take communion together. And this communion symbolizes this remembrance of what Jesus and symbolizes Jesus on the cross and the, and the new covenant, the sacrifice that was made. And so I know in this time, early on in the years, it's, it's easy to look back and try to remember like, you know, we just talked about what came out of 2020. Was it, was it all bad? And one of the best things we do weekly is to remember the sacrifice of Jesus because it was a gift given freely for us that met a need beyond anything that we could ever do. We could never be perfect enough, clean enough. We could never clean ourselves up enough to bridge the gap. So God did it for us. So today, as we're taking communion, we encourage all everyone to take communion together in this time. Even if you're at home, if you're in the room here, or if you're on your couch, we encourage you just to take a minute, bring that to mind, remembering and just saying, like, God, thank you for doing what I could never do. So Father, we worship you through this, this communion. As we commune together, God, as we worship together today, would we worship through remembering the sacrifice through remembering all that Jesus did in the way that you made a way when there was no other way. We worship you, God. It's all for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. ago we started this series titled We Love the 40509 and we began by looking at the instructions that Jesus gave to his followers found in Acts of first chapter verse 8. This is what I pick it up in the middle of the verse he says and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then the next verse says he ascended to heaven. He said those words and then he ascended to heaven. I've been convinced for a long time that one of the greatest acts of love a Christian can show another person is to introduce them to Jesus. You can't make anyone follow Jesus, but you can give them the opportunity to follow him. I shared a strategy in that first sermon of the series to help us to be as effective as we can possibly be at witnessing. And that series strategy was very simple. Pray, show kindness, share your story, invite them to experience things where they can have an encounter with God, and then encourage them to follow Jesus. And then last week, Philip shared the importance that Jesus places on us loving our neighbors. He shared the parable of the Good Samaritan where you have these two religious leaders, a priest and a Levite, and they pass by this man who had been mugged and left on the side of the road for dead. They weren't unable, they were unwilling, Philip said. But when we love our neighbors like the Good Samaritan did, we will be building a bridge that supports the truth that they, they need to hear. Here's a question. 
What could happen if love motivated us to be the witnesses that Jesus called us to be? That's what we want to look at today. The story is that it happened around 5.30 in the evening on December the 10th, 1914. It was a massive explosion that erupted in West Orange, New Jersey. Ten buildings were engulfed in what was known as the legendary inventor Thomas Edison's research plant. They said as many as eight fire departments rushed to the scene, but the chemical-fueled fire was too powerful to be put out quickly. According to a 1961 Reader's Digest article by Edison's son, Charles Edison, Thomas calmly walked over to his son as he watched the fire destroy all of his father's work. And in a childlike voice, Thomas Edison told his 24-year-old son this. He said, go get your mother and all her friends. They'll never see a fire like this again. Occasionally something comes along that is so incredible that when you experience it, you can't wait to share it with others, especially with people who you want to experience it for themselves also. You don't want them to miss out on it. It's that amazing. Examples of this on kind of a, a simple level is you see a movie and it, you, you're, you thought it was just incredible. Or maybe it's a new show, comes out on Netflix or Hulu and you find yourself binging the entire season and then the next thing you do is tell everybody about it. You talk about it, you post about it because you want everyone to know that you thought it was so great. This happened to me last week with some of my friends. A few of my friends who are Cleveland Brown fans, they weighed in with me on how great their team was, at least last Sunday night, when they beat my favorite team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. They were so excited to share with me specifically that their team is just so incredible. They wanted me to experience this awesome experience that they were having. They didn't want me to miss it. Mostly because they hadn't experienced winning in the playoffs much over the last 40 years. It was so kind to them to want to share their joy with me. Seriously, when you're passionate, passionate about something, you can't wait to share your experience with other people. And it's the key relationships in our lives those who we are close to, that we want, that we are most inclined to share those important moments with. As followers of Jesus, we have the greatest blessing to share. We have a message that can set people free and give them hope of spending eternity in heaven with God. Today I wanna to tell you about two guys who shared their experiences in two extremely different relationships. The first one is found in John, the first chapter. If you have your Bible or follow along on an app, turn to John chapter one. We're gonna start with verse 35. John chapter one, 35. The next day, John was there again. It's John the Baptist he's talking about. John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. These two disciples of John the Baptist are not named here, but we will later learn in a few verses that one of them is Andrew, the brother of Peter. The other, most scholars believe, is probably John, who is the author of this book we're reading, the Gospel of John. These two disciples were students of John the Baptist, which means they traveled with him and studied under him as he taught. But when they learned that John say, they, when they heard John say this about Jesus, that he is the Lamb of God, they immediately left John the Baptist 
and started following Jesus. Story continues in verse 38. It says, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. After hearing John the Baptist's declaration that Jesus was the Lamb of God, and then spending the next several hours with him, something significant happened. We pick it up in verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Andrew's story is a classic example of what we do when we have something so important, so amazing, so awesome that we want to share it with those who are important to us. Those closest to us are almost always the first people we want to tell important things to. Isn't that true? Let's examine this a little bit. When Andrew learns who Jesus is, and he spends a few hours with him, the first thing he does is to find his brother Simon, who we are gonna later find out they're gonna, Jesus will change his name to Peter. And then when he finds Peter, the message he gives him is, we have found the Messiah. Now every Jew was looking for the Messiah. For centuries they'd been looking for him. And Andrew doesn't say to his brother, hey, there's a guy and he's really interesting. Or, hey, I've met this, this rabbi and you gotta hear this guy teach. No, he told his brother, we have found the Messiah. And then Andrew took his brother to meet Jesus. And Simon Peter's life would take on new meaning. Not long after meeting Jesus, Matthew records a defining moment for these brothers. It's found in Matthew, the fourth chapter. And he said to them, Jesus talking to Andrew and Peter, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Peter and Andrew would begin a journey that was defined by an eternal purpose. They would play key roles that would have a tremendous impact on not just their day, but for the generations to come. For just a moment, I want you to think just how important Andrew's actions were to the overall biblical narrative. If he doesn't see the importance or place value on telling his brother Peter about Jesus, and as a result, never takes Peter to meet Jesus, then the story of the church may very well have been radically different. As important as Andrew taking Peter to meet Jesus was, it's equally important that you and I are sharing the good news with others who aren't yet part of the family of God. We all have family or close friends who've not yet decided to follow Jesus. And we can, we can make that introduction to Jesus by inviting them to worship with us, whether here in person or through these online experiences, or simply to have coffee with them, to have the opportunity to share your story about what Jesus means to you Whatever it takes, make sure that those who we love have had a chance to meet Jesus. Well, there's a second story I want us to examine today. And unlike Andrew, who knew his brother Peter extremely well, this next story is about two men who had never met. It's found in Acts, the ninth chapter, starting with verse 10. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. 
the Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarshish named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, who are these two men, Ananias and Saul? Ananias may not be all that familiar to many, but he was a devout and very respected Christian who lived in Damascus. Saul, on the other hand, was a Jew. Most of us know him as the Apostle Paul. He was a deeply passionate man at this point for the Jewish faith. He was a Pharisee, and he believed that this new movement led by Jesus of Nazareth was a serious threat to the true faith of Judaism. In fact, at the beginning of chapter 9 in the book of Acts, we read, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He was dead serious about eradicating this new movement. One day, while on his way to arrest Christians in Damascus, he was confronted by Jesus. It was in that moment that Saul realized he had been completely wrong about Jesus. He would eventually make his way to Damascus and he would arrive there as a man who was blind. God's vision to Ananias continues. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. It's clear at this point in this vision that the vision that God is giving Ananias is very troubling to this disciple. Ananias told God that he'd heard all about Saul and the devastation that he had done to God's people. Ananias was aware that the very reason Saul had come to Damascus was to arrest everyone who calls themselves a Christian. Now, Ananias wasn't arguing with God, but it seems he wanted to get clarification to make sure they were talking about the same man. It is clear that the idea of Ananias going to meet Saul terrifies him. God responded. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. God's response may not have made a whole lot of sense in that moment to Ananias, but God had a plan for Saul. Soon he would be one of the brightest lights for the gospel, shining bright in nearly every corner of the Roman world. And that may not have made much sense to Ananias at the time God was explaining it, but God's explanation was crystal clear. So Ananias, even maybe with a little bit of fear, he went as God had instructed him. Verse, nine, verse 17 through 19, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Here's a key point. Sometimes God directs us to go to people we don't even know. Sometimes. Ananias was a faithful follower of Jesus. In fact, tradition tells us that he died a martyr's death because of his faith. God sent a message to Ananias through a vision. He was likely terrified initially anyway, by the mission God was calling him to. But the result of Ananias going led to Paul receiving his sight and being baptized. And over the coming years, Paul would be that bright light of the gospel, and he would plant churches throughout the Roman Empire. It's natural to want to share good news with someone who we love, 
but we may not be as motivated to share with people we don't even know, we've never met. Or like in Ananias' case, with people who are adversaries, who would desire harm come to us. We've talked throughout this series that we want to love our neighbors, especially those who are neighbors of us here in the 40509. But sometimes, when it comes to love, we're not quite there yet. We may not love them, so God will give us a little bit of motivation. It would have been unlikely that Ananias would have gone unsolicited by God to go meet Paul, even if he had known that Saul had come to Damascus. You see, Saul had a notorious reputation for persecuting the church, so God called Ananias in a vision to go meet Paul. God may not call you in a vision, but you may have God nudge you. He may tug on your heart through a feeling for that person. He may put a person on your mind or give you an idea of how you could share the good news of Jesus with them or, or something that you could invite them to where they could have an encounter with God. Or, or God might open a door of opportunity for you. Someone asks a question about Jesus or about your faith or where you go to church. And it allows you to share what Jesus means to you, to tell your story about how he impacted your life. One thing you will see in the life of the Apostle Paul is that he was always on the way to share the gospel with someone. Philippians 1.21, for to me, Paul's saying, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He was one of the most prolific ambassadors for Jesus in all of history. He wanted everyone to know Jesus and follow him. He summed up his life this way in Acts 20, verse 24. He said, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. People knowing Jesus was what mattered the most to Paul. And what's interesting, Ananias had a part in the beginning of all of that. Paul was sold out to God and he cared about people. I wonder if I could increase my love for others. Is it possible that I could trust God to grow my heart so that I would share the good news with anyone? I wonder if it's possible. I believe it is. There are people all around the 40509 and beyond who have not yet met Jesus. There are so many who are just one heartbeat away from spending eternity without God. Let's love them like we love our family, like we love our friends, so that we are motivated to make sure they get introduced to Jesus. I want to close with this story. In 1854, a 17-year-old young man was working in a Detroit shoe store. He didn't know Jesus, had no interest in spiritual things or religion for that matter, but he had been forced to go to Sunday school like a lot of kids those days. One day, his Sunday school teacher, a man by the name of Edward Kimball, went to the shoe store where this young man was working. And he said to him, hey, I'm worried about you. I wanna talk. So the two of them went into the back room of the shoe store where the Sunday school teacher would eventually lead this young man to Christ. Edward Kimball would say later, I simply told him of Christ's love for him and the love Christ wants in return. That 17-year-old boy's name was Dwight L. Moody. We now know he went on to become one of the greatest evangelists 
of all time, sharing the gospel with over 100 million people. It's impossible to calculate the number of people who are in heaven today because of the work of Dwight L. Moody. God did an amazing thing through him. And all of that happened because of the love that Edward Kimball had to make sure that a 17-year-old Dwight would meet Jesus. God may do the same thing through you. Let's pray together. God, we know you and we love you. Many of us have walked with you for a few months, maybe even a few years, maybe many, many years. And we're grateful, God, that you extended to us grace. We're thankful that we were able to surrender to you. And we are so grateful, God, that you have washed our sins away. Lord, we want that for others. People who we know and love dearly and for those, we also want it for those who are far from you who we have no idea, we have not met yet. I pray, God, for our family and friends, our neighbors, to come to know you, to put their trust in you and choose to follow you. God, I pray for a harvest of people who say yes to Jesus, surrender to live their lives for him. Lord, use us. Give us your words to speak and courage to speak them at the right time, with the right tone, with the right attitude. God, massage our hearts, prepare them so that we are always ready to give an answer to those who have questions who want to know more about you. Lord, we pray for this harvest. And Lord, I also pray today for our nation. There is so much division, disagreement, so many arguments, conflicts, so much hatred. Lord, I pray you will heal our land. Use us, God, to be peacemakers. Guide our steps to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Forgive us, God, if we have spoken out of turn or we've stirred up the problems of our culture by what we've said or by what we've done. We know that Jesus is the answer for the problems that we face today. He's always been the answer. So help us to make Jesus known. Help us to introduce Jesus to those who haven't met him yet. For your glory, God, in your name, we pray this. Amen. Well, church, I've been so encouraged by this series today, an encouraging word. And I encourage you, if you haven't been able to, to tune in with us for the past couple of weeks, like go back and, and check it out. This is a series you don't want to miss, especially as we move into this new year. And we can say, you know what, like I can't control anything that happened in, in 2020 and I can't control anything that's going to happen this year, but I can control how I'm going to respond and I can control intentionally loving those closest around you like in proximity across the street in my own backyard like i can control how i intentionally love those around me so like if if these sermons hit with you connected with you you have any questions like feel free to reach out to us right now on where on whatever platform you're watching from or shoot us a note at notes to money at ncclex.org as always the best way to connect with us is over at our website ncclex.org org uh, slash connect it's a place where you can fill out a connect card we'd love to just answer any questions you have pray with you this morning whatever you may need go check that out and church we always close with this time of of generosity knowing that like without that without northeast owners contributing with with that generosity like we, we can't do this we can't meet online with the equipment that is needed we can't meet in a building safely and cleanly for those who are ready to come back so however you give if it's text to give if it's through the church 
app, if it's through the mail, however it is, we just want to say thank you for partnering with us as we fulfill the mission that God's put on Northeast to love those around us. Well, guys, that's all we have today. We look forward to seeing you next week. God be blessed.